Father, we thank you tonight for our leaders development meeting. Thank you for your people, pastors, leaders, overseers, here and everywhere. We're asking, Lord, that today you open our eyes and give us real revelation concerning our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. And we pray that the revelation you give us will impart our lives. There will be a permanent work of transformation at a higher level than we had known before in Jesus' name. Bless us that we can bless your people in our congregations. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're coming to Matthew chapter 16. Reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 16. Reading from verse 13. When Jesus came into the course of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Then in verse 14, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then in verse 15, He says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? In verse 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, in verse 17, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven, verse 18, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, verse 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verse 20 then tells us, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Verse 21. In verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again from on the third day. Verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, they shall not be unto thee. In verse 23, it tells us, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. In uh, Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 27, it says in Matthew 11 verse 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save that is except the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. 
Tonight, as we look at uh, these verses that we have read, we see the identification of the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed by God in heaven. The Lord asked his disciples, Who do people say? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He wanted to know from them in their interaction with the people of the world and the people in society, what do people say about me? And the people in the world that may say, some said, is John the Baptist. Others said, he's Elias, Elijah. Others said, he is Jeremiah. Others said, he's just one of the prophets. Now, people may say they believe in Jesus Christ, depending on the content of their faith the content of their profession and the content of their declaration. If they only say Christ is mighty and powerful, Christ is like John the Baptist or Christ is like Jeremiah, like Elijah and Christ is like one of the prophets. Although we might say that what they were saying is positive, they are not uh, saying he was a bad man, or righteous man, uh, he pretender. They are not talking like the Pharisees that he has Beelzebub and that he is casting out devils by the spirit of Beelzebub yet. What they say about Christ does not measure up to give them uh, salvation. Those who say Christ was a good man and Christ was a good teacher, good master, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God and have eternal life? It is not enough to say Christ is good, Christ is righteous, and Christ is mighty, and Christ is just like one of the prophets that does not save the soul. And now Christ wanted to know from his own disciples, I've heard what you have said of the ideas of the world, the opinions of the world. You tell me, what do you know about me? And what do you say about me? And then Peter, representing all the others and speaking on behalf of all the others, said, Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. And the Lord Jesus said, Peter, you have not said that by yourself. You have said that by revelation. My father who is in heaven has revealed that unto you. That's the revelation that brings salvation. The revelation that brings the kingdom of God to us and us into the kingdom of God. You must ask yourself, what's your knowledge about Christ? Experiential knowledge, personal knowledge. The thing you know from your heart that this is Christ, the Son of the living God, your personal Savior. What, who is Christ? His Savior. Who is Christ? His sanctifier. You must know that personally. Who is Christ? Is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Who is Christ? Is the one that energizes us and sustains us and he blesses us. Is the one that is full of grace and full of truth and out of his truth, out of his grace, we have from him. Who is Christ? Is our shepherd. Who is Christ? Is the one that leads the way, the forerunner of faith for the believers who are following after the Lord. We must have that personal knowledge. If we don't have any personal knowledge, if it's just that, you know, I'm coming, I know Christ, so somebody told me, is this, is that, what do you say yourself that Christ is the Son of the living God? And Jesus said, nobody knows the Father except the Son. And no one knows the Son but the Father. And to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The Father revealed the Son. To the Lord, uh, to Peter, and Jesus Christ revealed the Father to all the disciples. Today, we're looking at the message, the pertinent revelation of the redeeming Christ. Not just Christ, Christ who redeems, Christ who saves, Christ who turns our lives around, Christ who is able to transform us from being a sinner to being a saint. The pertinent relevant 
present day permanent revelation of the redeeming Christ. There are three points we're looking at. Number one, the penetrating recognition of Christ from the heart. What Peter said, he said from the heart. And it was a penetrating revelation. And all the other disciples too, they agreed with that because they had the same personal knowledge, experiential knowledge about Jesus Christ, the penetrating recognition of Christ from the heart. Point number two, the precious revelation of Christ by himself. After Peter had spoken, then Christ began to reveal himself and his project, his program. The reason he came to the world and what he was going to accomplish for the salvation of everyone from that time even to the end of the age. The precious revelation of Christ by himself. Number three, our personal restoration of consecration for the highest our personal restoration were renewed were revived and then we bring all our consecration all our skill everything we have even if it entails bearing the cross if it entails suffering persecution yet we pursue the way of righteousness and we're dedicated to the lord devoted to the lord in a personal way if our consecration had been reduced or taken away we restore everything now that we ever consecrated to the lord for the highest because the service of the Lord is the highest service we can commit ourselves to. We're coming to number one. Number one is the penetrating recognition of Christ from the heart. Understand? Whatever confession we make of Christ, whatever we say of Christ, if it is not coming from the heart, it's not acceptable before the Lord. If it's from the mind, from the head, if it's from what we read in the library books, if it's only what we read in the booklet, said the scripture booklet, they say so, they write it, and so I parrot it and I give it back to the people who are asking me question that one doesn't show experience it doesn't show we have a personal contact a personal revelation by the lord but when it comes from the depth of the heart and we have the conviction that no matter where we are and no matter who is asking us our deep conviction that nothing can take away from the earth is that jesus is the very son of god our savior and redeemer the penetrating recognition of Christ from the heart. There are three things we're looking at here. We're looking at number one, the proper expressed knowledge of Christ. Knowledge of Christ expressed. Proper expressed knowledge of Christ. Number two, personal experiential knowledge of Christ. Personal that it's not what Peter said that you'll go for John. It's not what James said that you'll go for Andrew. But each one personally recognizing that I know him. I have met him. He has done a work of grace in my heart and in my life. And I, by experience, I, by that reconciliation with the Lord, I make a personal confession. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Number three is the persuasive expounded knowledge of Christ. We take it from ourselves now and we go to give others and we give them convincingly and we give them persuasively that Christ is the Son of God. We might be talking to a Pharisee or a Sadducee or members of the Sanhedrin or we might be talking to a religious man, a religious woman. We're declaring to that person that we know Christ personally and he too, she too must know Christ personally having a persuasive exposition of the word of God showing everyone that this Jesus of whom I speak 
is the Christ, the Savior. He is the Christ, the Sanctifier. He is the Christ, the Baptizer and the Holy Ghost. He is the Christ, the coming King. is coming again. Let's look at number one. Number one is the proper express knowledge of Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 15, He says unto them, But who say ye that I am? You have popular knowledge, you have secular knowledge, and you have the public uh, declarations about Christ. They say, is this, is this, is whom do you say that I am? You must be able to say, if somebody were to ask you, how have you met him? Have you known him? Have you seen him? Has he done something definite in your life? The proper expressed knowledge of Christ. And then in verse 16, in verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, in verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, son, Simon Bajuna, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee. What's that? Flesh and blood. Professor, flesh and blood. Philosopher, flesh and blood. Preacher, flesh and blood. Pastor, flesh and blood. blood. A human being, flesh and blood. Daddy, that's what daddy told me, flesh and blood. That's what mommy told me, flesh and blood. The people, human beings, people like yourselves, they say, Christ Jesus is the Christ. And then uh, Jesus is asking you now, who do you say that I am? And you repeat what daddy or mommy or pastor or professor or your philosopher has said. That's flesh and blood. But Jesus Christ said we must go beyond that. We must go beyond what we read in books. We must go beyond what a teacher, what a pastor, what anyone is saying. We must have a personal knowledge of the Lord. So he said, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In John chapter 6, we're looking at verse 67. Here is the confession again that came out of Peter. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Will ye also go away? Other people, they've gone away. They came to follow Jesus, they had ulterior motive. They wanted bread, they wanted sustenance, they wanted supply, they wanted material things. And as Jesus began to tell them how salvation comes and what they must get from him and how must, they must be so attached unto him before that salvation can be theirs, they said, this is an hard saying and who can receive it? And then from that time, many of those people went back. If you don't have a personal knowledge and personal conviction about the Lord Jesus Christ, something will happen that will make you feel that's hard, that's tough. I don't think I can go by that. And now Jesus asked them, others have gone. Others have left. Others who do not have real conviction, they've gone away. Will you also go away? And then in verse 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And then he says in verse 69, and we believe not just him alone, and we believe and assure that thou art the Christ. We're not waiting for anyone again to come and save us. Thou at the Christ. We're not looking and checking up in the book of in the books of the Old Testament of the prophets whether you feed into the personality that Isaiah, that Jeremiah, that Ezekiel, that all the prophets describe. We know you have come as a fulfillment of everything they said in the old covenant. We believe and we're sure that thou art that Christ that Christ that the prophet spoke about in the old covenant, the son of 
the living God. Chapter 20, verse 31. In chapter 20, verse 31, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Here John was saying, Peter believed it. I believe it. All those apostles, they believed it and were preaching it for you so that you will read, you will understand what we are seeing and you also will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that believing ye might have life, everlasting life, spiritual life, heavenly life through his name. Let's come to number two here. Number two, we're looking at personal experiential knowledge of Christ. Personal experiential knowledge of Christ. It tells us in Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 8. It says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Ye doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Christ Jesus, my Lord, personal, my Lord, my Savior, my sanctifier, my controller, my director, my shepherd, the one I've given my life to, and as a personal knowledge, personal reconciliation with God, personal redemption from Christ, and He is my Lord. And then He says, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but don't that I I personal whatever others do whatever others dodge whatever others accept or they don't accept that I may win Christ look at verse 9 there in verse 9 and I be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith Paul the Apostle made it personal he said it's the personal experience that I have with the Lord and then in verse 10 in verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection he says when we know him in that personal way that the power that comes from his resurrection impacts our lives and it influences our lives it penetrates our lives and you must be asking yourself, do you have that personal experience of Christ as your Savior, as your sanctifier, as the one that transforms your life and changes everything? Can you tell the day when that happened? The time when that happened, what did you hear that made that to happen? How did you pray that made that to happen? What change, what effect actually came out in you when that happened? If you cannot remember the day, the time, the how, the where, and the change, the transformation that happened, when you profess you met the Lord, maybe you should go back to Calvary and check up and find out that is the place I met him. Anytime Paul the Apostle spoke about his meeting the Lord, he could tell. He said, I was my way to Damascus and I wanted to lay hold on those the people that went this way and called the name of the Lord and suddenly there was a light from heaven and then we fell down and I heard the voice that said, so, so, why persecutest thou me? And I said, who art thou Lord? And he said, I I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hand for thee to kick against the bricks. And then I asked him, I said, what will I do? What will you have me to do? And he directed me. And then as I got there, I was praying. He was having communion with God. And Ananias came and laid hands on him and said, brother Saul, 
other people also knew that he had that personal experience. Do you know? Are you sure? Beyond any shadow of doubt, there was that day and that time and that moment when you knew the Lord and you have that personal experiential knowledge of Christ. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. We're looking at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're well, reading from verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having day seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. The people who belong to the Lord, they know him. And then the Lord knows them too. It's a two-way traffic. I know him, he knows him, he knows me. You know him, he knows you. It says the Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If we're really going to show that we know him, then he has taken us away from the darkness of the world. He has taken us away from our depraved past lives. He has taken us away from the common attitude and the common habit of the people of the world. Everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Look at verse 21. It says, but and if a man therefore purge himself Himself, purge himself. He personally really knows the Lord is not waiting for other people. He's not watching the lives of other people. If they repent, I repent. If they clear their lives from all those pollutions, then I will. After all, they are greater, they are higher in position. And if they consecrate, then I consecrate. No, it's a personal thing. You came into this world personal. You are born by yourself. And you came into the kingdom by being born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That was personal. And when you leave this world, and you are going to be with him up there, it's going to be personal when the gates of heaven will open and the saints of God will go marching in. It's going to be personal. So it is not I'm waiting for so and so. I'm waiting for such and such. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared, prepared, prepared unto every good work. I pray it will happen in every life. Amen. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at persuasive, expounded knowledge of Christ. When we know Christ, we want to make him known. When we know him as Savior, we want to tell everyone convincingly that Christ saved me and he can save you too. When he has sanctified us, we're not ashamed of sanctification and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. He sanctified me. How do you know he sanctified you? He did this in my heart. He circumcised my heart. He took away the stony heart. I know what I used to be before sanctification. Now I know him. Then you want to persuade others, expound the word of God to others so that the same experience that you have they can have to persuasive ex expounded knowledge of Christ in uh, Luke chapter 24 verse 27 it says I'm beginning at Moses and all the prophets he Christ expounded that's the word expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself concerning his death concerning his resurrection concerning his doctrine concerning the transforming power that comes through him he expounded unto them in all the scriptures that things concerning himself. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he said 
unto them these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled all things must be fulfilled all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me in verse 45 then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures verse 46 it says and said unto them thus it is reaching and thus it behooved christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Acts chapter 18, reading from verse 26. Acts 18, verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. If you're sure of what you are saying, you will boldly declare what you're saying. The teacher in our school, in the world, because he knows his subject from the beginning to the end, and he knows all the nuances of that subject, he stands in front of his uh, class and he speaks boldly. And because the leaders of the world, they know what they are talking about when they talk about economy, when they talk about, um, you know, the, the uh, population growth, and they talk about everything we need, they come, they don't fidget, they're not looking down because they are masters of their subject. They speak boldly. The child of God, the son of God, the servant of God, the preacher of the word, when he knows Christ and he knows there's no other way. If we're going to be saved, it is through Christ and Christ alone. You don't come apologet apologetically, you speak boldly, convincingly, persuasively that this is Christ the Savior, the one who knows the importance and the um, essential nature of holiness and he knows that without this no one will get to heaven. He doesn't come speak about holiness apologetically. He speaks boldly. Anything you know in the world and you have experienced that thing yourself and nobody can push you or shift you or drive you away from that conviction. When you come and you speak, you speak boldly. When you come to your local church and you stand before that local church that you are ministering to, you know there are sinners there. If you don't speak confidently and convincingly, the sinners will not repent. You know there are believers there. If you don't speak convincingly and persuasively, those believers will not grow. They will not go from the level of salvation to sanctification. Therefore, you come and because this is an experience you have yourself about who Christ is. You will speak boldly, persuasively, intelligently, and in a coordinated manner. It says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded. Has fellowship expounded, talking to one individual expounded, explaining anything to somebody who has con who has confusion. You want to take him from the level of confusion to conviction. Expounded, it says they expounded unto him the way of. God more perfectly in verse 27 in verse 27 it says and when it was disposed to pass into Achaia the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him whom when he was come held 
them much which had believed through grace. And then in verse 28 it says, For he mightily convinced the Jews that and that publicly and showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 3, it tells us, Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 3, Acts 17 verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ would need to have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Uh, can you see how, how certain, how sure, how definite that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, this is Christ. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, he tells us, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Verse 30, in verse 30, it tells us that the times of this ignorance got winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31, in verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Verse 34. In verse 34, how be it certain men clave unto him and believed among the which was Dionysius, the Aripurgite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. We come to point number two now. Point number two, the precious revelation of Christ by himself, of himself, concerning himself. We're looking at Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 21. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he, Christ, must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, many things of the elders, and also and the priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, Christ's revelation of his death and resurrection. Number two, complete redemption through his death and resurrection. Number three, confirmed righteousness through his death and resurrection. Number one, Christ's Revelation of his death and resurrection. Matthew 16, reading from verse 21 again, from that time forth. Now that Peter, representing all the other disciples and apostles, had confessed that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, from that time began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now Christ opened to them. It, it wasn't 
a new idea. What he knew the previous day. Before the foundation of the world, this had been decided that man will need a substitute, a savior, somebody that is sinless, perfect, holy, without stain, without spot, to come and die for the whole of humanity. Look at Revelation chapter 13, reading from verse 8. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the beast, the antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb. Which Lamb? The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb slain, sacrificed for the salvation of humanity. Now, Peter did not know that, did not understand that. And immediately Jesus revealed to him and to them that this had been the reason why I came, to bring redemption to humanity. And I have to pass through the gate of death and then be buried. Then on the third day, I will rise again. Then Peter took him and rebuked him and said, Lord, that will not happen unto you. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Do you understand how somebody can be used of God to reveal thou art Christ, the Son of the living God, having a revelation with God from God, reconciliation to God, having the connection with God, and God revealed to him that this is my son, and this is the Savior. And then that person can still be influenced by Satan. That's the reason why you cannot say, is so and so, he taught me something deep and high that I never knew. Whatever he says, any time I accept. Uh -uh, you can do that. You must still take every statement he makes, like Simon Peter. You take them and compare them with the scriptures, with the revelation of God, because that revelation is what is eternal. And the revelation that Christ will come, He'll be slain. He will die for the sins of humanity. That is from all eternity before the foundation of the world. And anyone, whatever is status, anyone, whatever is knowledge, anyone, whatever is experience, whatever is usefulness, and what he had revealed before, if he comes now and he negates, what had been decided in heaven from all eternity. And then you say, well, he's so and so. He is a man of revelation. He's a man of authority. He's a man of integrity. Jesus didn't say that about Peter. We must be discerning. We cannot give our soul, we cannot give our heart to somebody because of his past record. We must still examine everything on the basis of the word of God. And so Jesus said, Peter, get there behind me. Because you are an offense unto me, wanting to hinder me from what I had decided from all eternity with my heavenly Father. Now it's Satan that is revealing this one to you. And you need to check up your own life too when you are acting out of human sympathy, human ideology and human generosity that that will not happen and you hinder Christ or you hinder the Christian or you hinder the minister or you hinder a person that lays everything on the altar and you say that will not be 
you might be under the influence and control of Satan. And if anyone like that uh, has that influence in your life, you must be as bold as Christ to say, get thee behind me because you want to hinder me from doing the will of God that I have decided with the Lord. And he has accepted, ratified, sanctioned the consecration. And so we understand that what Peter said wasn't according to the will of God. It tells us in uh, Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 44. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 44. Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hand of men. Let that sink into your ears. Don't shake it off. Don't say, I don't agree with that. Don't say, Lord, that will never happen to you. Let it sink deep into your ears. These uh, precious revelations in the word of God must sink into our hearts so that we'll not become people that will shy away from the revelation of the Lord. We're looking at number two here. Number two is the complete redemption through his death and resurrection. The, the, the redemption we have, the salvation we have, the righteousness we have, and the pathway and the highway that leads us to heaven is on the basis of his death and resurrection. Actually, if Christ had listened to Peter, he would not, he could not, he will not. But if Christ had listened to Peter, how will you be saved? How will I be saved? And of the millions that have been saved since that time until now, how would they have been saved? Peter was trying to block the salvation of humanity because the redemption we have can only be on the basis of the death and the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then in verse 4, it says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Death, resurrection, according to the scriptures. The redemption, according to the scriptures. A reconciliation with God, according to the scriptures. What Christ said, he must go to Jerusalem. He must die and then rise again the third day according to the scriptures. What Peter said, Lord, that will not happen to you. That be far from thee, that one not according to the scriptures. Don't so much exalt any man, apostle or prophet, overseer or anyone don't ever exalt anyone that we cannot listen to christ again what christ has said we cannot follow that again apostle peter has said no it will not happen it must not happen apostle peter has said that before from you from us that will never happen don't allow any Peter, any Paul, any preacher, any pastor, any personality to hinder you from taking the totality of the word of God. Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 24. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. In verse 26, it says, to declare, I say, 
at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Who gave himself for us death and resurrection of Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We're looking at number three here. Number three, convert righteousness through his death and resurrection. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he has made him to be seen for us, to be the sin of freedom for us by his death and resurrection. The Father has made him Christ to be seen for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's only through that death and through that, res through that resurrection we can have righteousness acceptable unto God. We're looking at um, Revelation chapter 19 from verse 6. Revelation chapter 19 verse 6. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. How did the bride of Christ make herself ready? By his death and resurrection. Without the death and resurrection of Christ, there is no righteousness, there's no salvation, and there's no bride for the bridegroom. And so what Peter said, trying to talk like a forerunner for the apostles, and standing in front of the other apostles and saying, looking at Jesus, taking him by the hand, and looking at Jesus, to his face, you think that is boldness, that's hellish boldness that will hinder the bride of Christ from being born, from coming out of the sight, out of the death and resurrection of Christ. What's your kind of boldness if your boldness is to hinder sinners from becoming saints? If your boldness is to hinder the beloved, the children of God from becoming the bride of Christ. If your boldness is to hinder the readiness and preparation of the people of God for the rapture. What Peter was trying to contradict. What Peter was trying to cancel. Saying that be far from thee that was the thing to prepare the bride of Christ. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Look at verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be a rich in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We're looking at uh, point number three now. In point number three, it said uh, our personal restoration of consecration for the highest. We're coming to Matthew chapter 16. We're reading from verse 24. 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man, prophet or apostle, if any man, evangelist or pastor, if any man, teacher or minister, if any man, a new convert or an old timer, if any man, a follower, man or woman, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Verse 26, it says, For what's a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We're looking at three things here. Number one, a full salvation through Christ crucified on the cross. Number two, the faithful submission of consecrated cross carriers, cross bearers. Number three, the future status of Christ-like confirmed conquerors. Look at number one. Number one, a full salvation through Christ crucified on the cross. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 8. It says, For by grace are you saved through, uh, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Then in verse 13, in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus ye, who sometimes were far off and made nice by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ, the death of Christ. In verse 14, for he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Verse 15, and then it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God, both the Jews and the Gentiles, both unto God to be reconciled in one body by the cross, by his crucifixion, by his death and resurrection, by what that provides, he has now reconciled both the Jews and the Gentiles unto God, having slain the enmity thereby. And then in verse 17, it tells us in verse 17, and came and prayed peace unto you, which were far off, Gentiles, and to them which are near. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 8. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what brings us redemption. That's what brings us connection unto the Heavenly Father. That's what produces conversion in our lives. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 
that is, all our sins that should have brought judgment, punishment eternal upon us. It's by the death on the cross of Calvary that he took everything and nailed it to his cross. In verse 15, it says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in age. Look at number two. Number two, the faithful submission of the consecrated cross carriers. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You must ask yourself, a question there when last did you deny yourself of anything there are conveniences comforts luxury that will stand before you and following the Lord when last did you deny yourself of anything there are pleasures there are habits there are actions that will hinder you from being a pure child of God, follower of Christ. When last did you deny yourself of those habits, of those tendencies, of the things that might be convenient for you, but they do not make you the faithful follower of Christ? It says, if any man will come after me. Let him deny himself. It might be the pleasure of sleeping when you ought to read the Bible. It might be the pleasure of scrolling and surfing uh, the internet when you ought to give yourself to prayer and dedication uh, to the watch of God. It might be just, just relaxing, just sitting down and doing nothing but just resting uh, after you have slept so many hours instead of going out and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ when last did you deny yourself of anything for the sake of Christ? It might be the pleasure of just talking, talking about others. It goes from innocent talk to gossiping and slandering others. When last did you deny yourself of something you wanted to say and then you stop, you think, you reason, if I said that, that's not charity. If I said that, that is not love to my fellow brother or sister. If I said that, I will not be showing that I love him, I love her as myself. And if I cannot continue in love, I have to deny myself. You must ask yourself, what kind of Christian life do you have? Does it have any self-denial at all? It says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. The cross, just like the cross Jesus carried, he was tired, but he carried the cross. They jeered at him, but he carried the cross. They ridiculed him, but he carried the cross. He fell under the weight of the cross. But he carried the cross. He picked it up again until he went to that place. The place of the skull. And they nailed him to the cross. Have you carried any cross at all? Or any kind of thing that comes your way? The slander. The talk. And they shame you. And you say, I 
will not take that. I am a dignified man, a dignified woman. I'm not going to take foolishness or Christianity. I'm not going to take that kind of attitude or Christianity. My own Christianity does not allow anyone to touch my personality. Uh -huh. You cannot carry the cross. And if you are not carrying the cross, you are not following after the Lord. All that Christ went through, compare everything he went through for your sake. And yet, you are trying to dodge the cross. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. A little thing now, some. Christian men, so-called, they want to divorce that wife. You say, why? Look at what they do. Look at what she did. Look at what she did. They cannot carry their cross. They cannot bear the self-denial. Or oh, it's the woman. I'm not going to take that. And if the church goes against this kind of divorce, then I will leave the church. They cannot bear their cross. They cannot deny themselves. There are things that will happen. They will not be comfortable for the flesh. They will not be pleasurable for your life. But if you are born again, if you are a child of God and your commitment is to follow the Lord at all costs, whatever happens, you see, I am in the kingdom. I will remain in the kingdom and nothing will take me away from the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Nothing will take you away. Amen. The people who have gone before us, those apostles, the acts of the apostles, in the epistles, they suffered persecution. They had a heavy cross to carry. And they carried until the final day when they met the Lord face to face. You will not drop your cross Amen. and you will not transfer your cross to another person Amen. and there are people who are so clever that cross is coming and it's for them and they transfer the cross to their wives why do you do that she's of the weaker vessel if you cannot carry it why do you transfer it to your wife there are those who transfer it to their husbands there are those who transfer it to their leaders it's your cross and you shouldn't find a way to wriggle out of it because if any man will come after Christ let him let her deny himself deny herself and take up his cross and follow me look at verse 25 it says for whosoever will save his life. They always see a lion in the way. They always see danger in the way. If you want to do anything for the Lord, you want to go and evangelize, you want to do this, and you want to commit yourself fully to the Lord, they always see danger. They do not see the blessing in the way of duty, in the way of following after the things of the Lord, in the way of prayer, in the way of waiting upon the Lord. They always see danger. That's why it says, whosoever will save his life. They, they, they pet and pamper the flesh because they say, they're not thinking about their soul, about their spirit, only the flesh. Because if I do that, I, I fear for my life. I fear for pain. I fear for disagreement. I fear for this and that. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. I pray you throw yourself completely open to the word, to the will, to the way of God without any fear in Jesus' name. Look at verse 26. It says there, 
For what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world, those who are worldly wise, they are wise, they know how to avoid this, how to avoid that, they know how to dodge this, how to dodge that, they know how to, you know, stay in and not come out, they know how to, how not to come to the fellowship because, you know, there's danger. This is a busy, crowded city, and if you come out, like you come to attend the evening meetings, this may happen, that may happen. They are always running away from commitment and consecration unto the Lord. For what's a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I pray we'll continue till the end in our consecration and commitment in Jesus' name. Reni na wawakam sun shining where we we'll come the heat is there where we we'll come the cold is there where we we'll come until the last breath is breathed we'll keep on serving the Lord I I will keep on serving the Lord no boy no girl will stand in your way no man, no woman will stand in your way. No persecutor, no oppressor will stand in your way. God saw the other people through, he will see you through. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about was so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, all those excuses, all those encumbrances. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so does easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In verse 3, it says, For consider him, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 4, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Point number three, point number three here, the future status of Christ-like confirmed Conquers. Matthew chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 27. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Rewards are waiting for you. The appreciation of heaven is waiting for you. Everything we do, small or great, everything we do, private or public, everything we do, easy or difficult, everything we do in the path of duty is serving the Lord. Everything will be rewarded on the final day. And when Christ shall come, Christ shall appear and the dead in Christ shall rise and the saints alive will be changed because he'll change our vile body to become like unto his glorious body and then they will go all oh, praise the Lord you will be there I will be there I will be there You'll not be missing on that final day in Jesus' name. Your friends will be looking for you up there. Your neighbors 
who now eventually make it, they'll be looking for you out up, up there. And your wife making it will be looking for the husband. The husband making it will be looking for the wife. And the preacher, the pastor making it will be looking for you, the members and the ministers. And praise God, you'll say, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Through all the storm, through all the suffering, through all the persecution, others made it. Thank God, grace is available for you. You will make it in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, the final day, I will make it. Stand up, open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Hearing is not enough, we must pray and say, Lord, much grace I need, much devotion I need. And I need to bring everything on the altar of consecration. It's not the time to look back, to give up, to get tired. It's not the time to say, can I move on? You must, you must move on. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you know him? Christ? Do you know him? The Son of God? Do you know him? Savior? Do you know him? As the one that came to set us free? He shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. As he set you free. Free from sin. Free from bad habits. Free from falling and rising every time. You're stable, solid, steadfast believer in the Lord. Who do you say Christ is to you? Is my Savior. Is my sanctifier. Is my purifier. Is my refiner. Do you have that personal experience, knowledge of Christ? Can you tell where, when you met him? Can you tell what change happened in your life? The transformation, the transforming power of his death and resurrection. Do your neighbors know? Do your old time friends know that you met the Savior of sinners and he saved you? Your co-workers, they didn't know at that time Friends, neighbors, relatives, did they see a mighty change in your life? And then they began to ask you a question What happened? What happened? What happened? And then you confess Christ. He became my Savior. Do you know Him as Sanctifier? Really? I see taking away the stony heart, the stubborn nature, the incorrigible attitude. I see taking that away. I see giving you a heart of flesh, tender, teachable, following after the Lord. 
when did that happen? That sanctification, that tenderness of heart, that removal of the stony heart that he promised, I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will write my words on their hearts. When did that take place? And what change, mighty change, internal change, took place when he sanctified you? Can your wife tell all the nagging is over? All the boisterous anger is over? All the hard, harsh words over? Peace now in the heart and peace at home. Can your husband tell that that has happened to his beloved wife? Can the children tell that that has happened, that Christ, the sanctifier, has come and has sanctified the heart? Can our fellow brothers and sisters, can they tell? Now he walks softly, he talks softly, he behaves softly. All the harshness is gone. All the hard spirit, all that is gone. The sanctifier Christ has come and has sanctified him. Who is Christ to you? The baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Do you know him that way? Power. The power of the Holy Ghost that brings boldness, courage, ability to stand for what you know is right. No fear of man, no fear of consequences. Baptized, energized, empowered by the Holy Ghost. Who is Christ to you? The King, the Lord, who controls your life. In the day, in the night, anywhere, everywhere, not afraid to take a decision in devotion to the Lord. And what has the death and resurrection of Christ done? in your experience, in your life. Has he given you full redemption? Full redemption. The death and the resurrection of Christ. Has he given you verifiable righteousness that we can verify and your life, your heart is made righteous, free from sin by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Righteousness and holiness before Him all the days of our lives.
crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. You know him that way. He gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Are you now in total submission to the Lord? Nothing reserved, nothing taken away from the altar of consecration, or to Jesus I surrender. Or to him I freely, fully give. Are you, are you always looking at what it will be? The glory, the splendor, the reward in heaven, the future splendor when it will come for his soul. For those who are steadfast, following after the Lord, growing in the grace of God. We do not allow the multiplicity of evil in the last days to catch up with them. For their people when dear to the edge he has the grace tell him to grant you the grace to the faithful until the end denying yourself bearing your cross following after Christ In Jesus.